Okay, hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first session of the day, the neuroimaging session, um, and uh, the Timmy Symposium. So I hope you've all had a good time so far and have enjoyed the talks this morning. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kendall Lee of the Mayo Clinic to you this morning. His work um, I'm very familiar with. It's on deep, deep brain stimulation, which I also work on. Um, so I, I saw him talk last year at a surgical conference. It was a very good talk, and I think he's probably got an even better talk lined up for you this morning. Very exciting and full of uh, videos. Um, and so without further ado, I'll let uh, Dr. Lee take the floor. Okay, well, th thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. You know, I'm really impressed here. I want to thank Dr. Zhang for inviting me and the organizing committee. Um, I'm a neurosurgeon, and I direct the neuroengineering laboratories at the Mayo Clinic, and I wanted to show you some of the work that we're doing. Um, let me ask in the audience, how many of you have heard about deep brain stimulation? Raise your hand. Wow, so almost all of you. You know, when I first started this, I would give a talk about it, and nobody would raise their hand. So this, and, and that was only about 15 years ago. So you can see, in a period of 15 years, we went from really this tremendous um, adoption of this technology in Parkinson's, dystonia, tremor. Now, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is now approved by the FDA under HDE. And it's emerging for epilepsy, Tourette syndrome, uh, chronic vegetative state. I know there's a lot of work done here in New York City on that. Depression, pain, obesity, and even memory enhancement. So I think people have seen videos People like suffering this. from ailments like tremors and, and Parkinson's and disease rely on deep brain stimulation as a like treatment this. option. And now researchers you know, are exploring see, example, whether the same method Parkinson's can be used to treat DBS everything off, from depression DBS to disabilities on. caused by strokes. And deep this is, people this is not, not unusual. Uh, in fact, we do this, uh, I do about 100 of these operations a year at the Mayo Clinic. And you know, this is what, what it's done. Electrodes get implanted into the brain with devices like this. Uh, currently, it's the Medtronic device. There's now two other companies that's go going to be coming in, uh, St. Jude and Boston Scientific. But for the most part, pretty simple devices if you think about it. But one of the key features of this, and as we move forward in the technology development for DBS, is going to be how does it work? So that we can understand how it works, re-engineer it, and see if we can apply this technology in a variety of other things. So I, I, I saw this video, and I want to show you this video of early flight because I, I liken what's happening to TPS with something like this. Uh, and we just, my graduate student found this online. And you can see early flight, they were thinking, OK, we, we want man flight. We want man control flight, but we don't know how to do it. You know, let's just copy birds, right? It, it makes sense. Birds can fly, so just flap the wings. But obviously, that's not going to work, <laughs> OK? And you know, OK, power. Let's just use a lot of power. Well, that's not going to work either, you know? Here, no idea what they were thinking. <laughs> Absolutely. No clue, <laughs> you know? But here we go. Now, there is some flight. But what you're noticing here, it's, it's gliding, or here, but it's not controlled, you see? Until, of course, the Wright brothers came along, and this was the first controlled man flight. You see, it was not the first man flight. It was that control that was so important. This is where we are now. You know, I love the I love this Navy because I'm in the Navy. I served as a military neurosurgeon to Europe, and I spent about six months there, and really fell in love with the Navy. But the technologies, of course, that's really dependent on how are we going to get there, is going to be on imaging. Because as a neurosurgeon, I use image guidance in order to do my implantation surgeries. And this is what I use. This is the image that I use, use at the Mayo Clinic. It's a 1.5 Tesla. And the targets are STN for Parkinson's disease, the subthalamic nucleus, or VIM, ventralis intermedius, for tremor disorders. 
And you can kind of see that here, you know, as a neurosurgeon. And, and we get very good at looking at these type of images. And we use what's called indirect targeting. We find the AC, TC, and, and, and micro recordings and trying to find that target. But this is where we want to go. And I just found out you guys have a 7 Tesla system here at the Mount Sinai, which is really spectacular. And we just bought our first clinical, the Terra system at the Mayo Clinic. And now you can start to see the subthalamic nucleus. You see this sort of um, football-shaped structure? That's the target for Parkinson's disease, or VIM. And this is now very well established. In fact, over 130,000 people have already been implanted with these technologies. But where we want to go is now treat okay. patients like this. And then just take a walk This is a Tourette's patient right. before and after one of our surgeries. No. And we implanted central media and parafascicular nucleus. You see? This is a young man who came to me right before Okay. Christmas. Come on back. And he was doing thousands of these neck kicks a day. And, and before I got into Tourette's syndrome, I thought Tourette's was a no, movement no, disorder. And you can see why. This is before I really understood how these neural circuits And the are. train. But as is, it turns out, how, really, is the train, this is a combination they, of, they, of both movement disorder and psychiatric disorder. And I'm going to show you how we're moving into psychiatric disorders now. But as we do that, it's going to be crucial that we understand how does it work, how do we control this technology, what are the neural circuits that's being activated, and what are the neural chemicals that's being released, what does the oscillatory patterns look like, how is the brain going from this, what I showed you, to that. How are we doing that? Well, um, this is just to show you where in the brain we're going right into the center and thalamus, and thalamus is a very dear to my heart. I did my PhD work at Yale under David McCormick, under, trying to understand how do we go from the sleeping state to the awake state. My PhD was on mechanisms of consciousness. How do we wake up? And so the, the circuits that we're modulating now within the thalamus, all of these neural, basic neuroscience and the circuit analysis is becoming very important as we move this technology forward. This is a photograph of my operating room. So I operate here. And in my operating room is an MRI machine. And that allows me to directly image the patient, do surgery, and then take them back in with an implanted electrode to see what are we doing to the brain using fMRI technology. And in fact, we've now implanted five patients with that Tourette syndrome. And we are identifying the locations. And what we really want to do now is what are the circuits that's being activated when the DBS is working or when it's not working? And in fact, here are some of our early data looking, at, looking into that. And you can see that this is fMRI bold activation pattern in Tourette's patient on a cortical projection on PL surface and so forth, showing you what are the circuits using the bold signal that's mapping out the brain and those parts of the circuit that are modulating when we're controlling those Tourette's ticks. And in fact, what we're able to do is take our patients and videotape them before and after turning on the stimulation. But specific contacts and different parameters of that stimulation, we can turn it on and then, and then map out. On the left, you can see the Modify Rankin's video score of those Tourette's. And you can see versus sham versus DBS that there is an effect. And what you're seeing on the far left side is then looking at the increased bold signal, the decreased bold signal, and correlate it with the positive correlation versus negative correlation. And what's interesting about this data, and this is data that we just got and we're about to submit this paper, is that you can see that motor cortex, the somatosensory motor cortex activates. And what we're finding is that vocal versus motor tick reduction, there is differences in those circuits that's being activated. What's really interesting is that this data, our data in terms of the circuit activation patterns, mirrored very well another paper that was published in Neuron by McCarran et al. in 2016 when they evoked Tourette's-like symptoms 
and monkeys, as you can see on top, and compare that to the bottom. And the other area that's very interesting, in addition to the motor area that's being activated, is the cerebellum. Exactly what this is doing, exactly what are the circuits, and how this is modulating the brain is unknown. But at least now, we're understanding where things are happening. All right, so that's Tourette syndrome. Let me show you another type of psychiatric illness that we're treating at the Mayo Clinic, obsessive compulsive disorder. So we were participants before the FDA approved in an NIH-sponsored study on OCD for uh, DBS for obsessive compulsive disorder. And we recruited four patients for that study where intraoperatively we could monitor these patients' behavior and see what happens when we stimulate in a uh, area that has the positive effect versus negative effect. So let me show you the video of this. So this is how I do the surgery with the head frame on. The patient is awake, and the psychiatrist is asking, how's your mind? So it's a little more cluttered, more cluttered. Because before I went to the target, this is above the nucleus accumbent, which is one of the targets for and look at his face. This is a gentleman who had very severe obsessive compulsive disorder for a very long time. In fact, institutionalized, couldn't leave the home because of the severity. And now look, we're in the nucleus of the happy one. He is a happy one again. I can tell you the OR is not a happy study. Okay. Why are you smiling? That's me. Why are you smiling? Yeah. I felt happy all of a sudden. I don't know. I was just like I was sitting here and all of a sudden I felt happy. Okay. okay. And how about the thoughts, the reassurance? How about the thoughts of being in your mind and you bothering you? When, when I feel happy, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother you. No. So what is going on there? So we also looked at the fMRI bold pattern on these patients. And what we discovered is that the bad contact, that, that right before we get to the, our target of nucleus accumbens, gave us that pattern of act, bold activation, while on the other, it gave us this. Now, very similar what we noticed, very similar circuits are being activated, but, but the bold pattern was different. And so one of the things that we looked at there was that there was activation pattern near the nucleus accumbens. It doesn't show it in this cut, but we wanted to figure out then what's happening in those targets that's being activated. And so fMRI bold, you know, it shows you where things are happening, but it's not really showing you what. And so we wanted to use another technology called fast scan cyclovoltammetry. And let me ask in the audience, how many of you have heard of FSCV before? One. OK, perfect, perfect. All right, so fast scan cyclovoltammetry is the state of the art in neurochemical recording in vivo. And the way it works is you take a carbon fiber electrode, as you can see there, you put a triangular voltage, and this is very similar to the technology of patch clamping, like a voltage clamping. In fact, it is a voltage clamping, except rather than doing it intracellularly, what you're doing is clamping the electrode with a triangular wave, and every chemical that's oxidizable, oxidize, uh, remember from high school, chemistry means loses electrons oxidation, with, uh, gains electrons reduction. So it uses that idea so that dopamine, which loses electrons at about 0 0.6 volts and gains at minus 0 0.4, 0 0.2, produces signals like this, where uh, you can see this is time axis, the applied voltage. And what you're seeing here is the green spot. That's the color coding for the current. And when you do that, you can now get understand what the concentration of the neurochemical is. And what's exciting about this is you can do all of that in about 10 milliseconds. So boom, you can measure these neurotransmitter levels and, and, and get what's called voltammograms that you see up there. So you're doing basically at 10 hertz, each one of these lasting about 8.5 milliseconds. And when you do that, each of these chemicals have characteristic voltammograms. So there's the voltammogram for dopamine, there's for adenosine, and there's for both. So basically, this is like a chemical fingerprint, okay? So what we did was we used this technology in animals. You know, first we have to test this technology in animals. And so we implanted a pig in that exact same area, 
as we did in the human, the nucleus accumbens. We measured what was going on, and lo and behold, as our, we hypothesized that maybe dopamine, because the you know, nucleus accumbens is chock full of dopamine. And remember, dopamine, I showed you in the first slide, the Parkinson's patients lacks dopamine, that's for movement. But as it turns out, dopamine is also very important for psychiatric illnesses. The VTA dopamine uh, that actually goes into the nucleus accumbens. And what we measured was this signal. As we increase the voltage in this pig from three to five to seven, we could actually increase his dopamine level. And so I want to show you, this is not my video, but this is a video that was provided to me by Dr. Paul Garris, who's been doing these type of studies in vivo in rats. Okay, so this is a male rat that has one of these carbon fibers that's attached by a wire, you can see. Okay, and that bottom trace is his dopamine level. And this is female rat in the heat that was introduced. And look what happens to his dopamine, boom. Right there. Okay, you know I have good authority that in the female rat it went down. <laughs> but we're not gonna we're, we're not gonna talk about that. All right. So here is the problem, though. I, I want so I looked at this video, and as a neurosurgeon, I was salivating. I was salivating because, my goodness, you know, I'm putting electrodes into the human nucleus accumbens. We're measuring dopamine in pigs. Can we measure that in humans? But this was the problem. You know, that, that system, this is from UNC, University of North Carolina. You know, I went to my RB, I said, can I use this, you know, in my OR? And they said, are you nuts? <laughs> you can't do that. It's not safe. You've got to get the FDA approval. And so uh, I, I direct the neuroengineering laboratories in concert with our neuroengineering and division of engineering. We, melt, we made this first device called the WINK system. And it stands for a wireless instantaneous neurotransmitter concentration sensor system. It's a sensor which we used in, uh, under IRB in humans. Our latest is actually this. We've made a four-channel system in, on an integrated circuit. And this, we just got uh, accepted to scientific reports. I want to show you the video. Let's see if the video is going to But it's a black box. We want to open the black box. When you open it, it's a four-channel stimulation recording connected via um, both you can do it Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to main computer. And the thought was, can we then control that dopamine system? Remember what I showed you about early human flight. It's not about doing something. It's about that control system. And so, um, and as a disclosure, I have to say, we just got the US patent on this technology of closed loop electrochemical system. Um, all right. Let me show you something here. So the earlier speaker was talking about deep learning. So we're also using artificial uh, neural networks and deep learning because when you're trying to do this so fast, like in 10 milliseconds, you know, a human cannot make those type of calculations so quickly. And so we're, we're using the computational model and feedback strategies to modulate in vivo neurochemical systems. And we're testing it in large animal models, of course, here in the pig, where we're stimulating in the VTA area recording on the caudate and seeing, can, can we do this in real time? And indeed, these are the initial um, harmony system data in live animals where we're, we're doing that. So what you see here is that right there, we stimulated the pig's brain, and you can see the dopamine signal that we're recording. You see? And then all that system gets fed into the computer system and using a kinetic model and artificial neural network, we're using the computer now that's on the base station to control the stimulation system. Therefore, this is a true closed loop feedback neurochemical uh, control system. All right, so let, so let me show you another video. This is, so I was watching a movie at uh, the movie theater and Robocop came on. And there was a scene in there that I thought was really interesting. So let me show you this scene. And, and the preface to this is, you know, Robocop, he's a human that gets into um, a terrible accident, and they've converted him into Robocop, and, they're, they're, and he's getting PTSD and anxiety, okay? And, and they're trying to, this, the neurosurgeon there is trying to figure out how to control it. Watch this. To absorb dopamine and neurodermal. You'll be taking away his emotions. Drop the levels until I tell you to stop. stop. Dopamine levels at 20%. More. Two percent. Hold it there. Hold it there. 
Alex, how do you feel? I feel fine, Dr. Norton. Okay, a little bit uh, of a future, but I want to show you how we can control dopamine. And this is a, one, of, one of the first experiments that one of the assistant professors in Mayo Neuroengineering Laboratory has put together. And it was just accepted last week, in fact, in scientific reports, so you can read about it. But we're, we wanted to see, OK, can we control the dopamine level? And the red bars are where we want to control it. And this movie is the actual data that shows that we're doing it. It overshot just a little bit and undershot just a little bit, so it's not perfect. But machine learning is not perfect. The artificial neural network is not perfect. But it's not too bad. It's performing, you can see there. And there it's nearly perfect. See? So the idea of this feedback neurochemical uh, system in the form of harmony is possible. And using this system, because we also have the um, controller and we can actually control the, in this case the pig's nucleus accumbens. When we stimulate, notice what it's doing, it's okay. So what that indicates is we're controlling his dopamine on the one side. Why? We've only implanted that electrode in the nucleus accumbens of one side, on the side that he's turning towards. And many of you may be aware that if you do this in rats, the turning behavior is one of the ways that we model uh, and see whether we can help Parkinsonian rats. And indeed, we can, we can do this in large animals as well. OK, fine, animal studies. You know. So we have the wing system with the wing's electrode in the patient. The patient is currently awake. This is under IRB's approved and study. And over here, you can see our wing wear. Analyzing the data that we're getting wirelessly. Okay, we're going to make one millimeter advancement. Go ahead and advance, please. And now we're getting the data in real time from the human brain in terms of the neural And right there. Excellent. So I'll place the background right before the insertion. And when we put the background right there, it's analyzing and you can see. Excellent. The neurochemical changes that's happening in a human brain undergoing neural surgery. So how could we use this technology? Well, one of the questions is tremor. You know, when we stimulate in the thalamus, in the VIM for tremor, we know we can stop the tremor, but what's going on there? So we asked the question, because understanding the mechanism is so important, can we place these electrodes, and I, I just showed you the sensor system, during DVS surgery, I have to put these probes in anyway to map out these sites. And what we did is on the um, surgical technique is that there's this thing called bend gun, where in the middle is the DVS electrode, but on the side are these microelectrodes that you can place. And in fact, a lot of neurosurgeons place five simultaneous electrodes. I happen to only use just one single sensor each time. But what we found is this. Let me show you. Okay. Let me see if I can show you this video. It's kind of interesting. So I'm asking, you can see the, at the top, the patient's holding right there. You can see it. He's holding an accelerometer, and the bottom trace is the accelerometer. You can see the tremor. And this is the voltammogram of the patient. And right there, do you see that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Right there. That's when. Okay, and you can see what we noticed is that signal at the top, those two. Let's get an X-ray, please. Adenosine. We measure adenosine. Hold your hand down. We didn't know what we would measure. Hold your hand down, sir. Closer to your nose. Okay, but now hold your hand down. Hold it right there. Hold, hold it right there. I'm saying. But look at. Are you measuring this? Are you getting this? This was one of the first times we did this. So look at his hand. I'm saying, are you measuring this? Look at his hand. And this was exciting because what this indicates is that the way we're stopping these tremor is neurochemical. Adenosine, you see, is a neurotransmitter that shifts the voltage-dependent activation of a very important current called IH in the thalamus. IH is crucial for our ability to oscillate. And what DVS and this, in this case, this is called microthalamotomy effect, where as a neurosurgeon, it's very common. We place the electrode and the tremor stops, as you saw here. 
And what this is showing is that effect is due to adenosine. Now, we're trying to figure this out. Does the stimulation also cause that? And our initial data is showing yes. But one of the problems was that stimulation artifact. We couldn't see it. And that was another impetus for building the Harmony system, which actually now can do both stimulation and recording simultaneously interleaved so that there is no stimulation artifact. All right, future. I want to go, I want to go to the future, future direction. Hi, so this Elliot. Is, this is my son. I'm daddy. Elliot, where's your eyes? OK, where's your ears? God. Where's your mouth? Good. Where's Those your hippocampus? Three. Right there? Okay. Where's your occipital lobe? Back there? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. All right. He's eight now, but, you know, I, I'm thinking, okay, these are the future. Can we teach him faster? You know? And um, you can see he's learning. But what about these other type of cases that's coming up. And I want to show you just a couple of more, um, I think, interesting applications of this technology. So here's a patient. He's a 29-year-old who accidentally stabbed himself. He was cutting a box. And he caused what's called a focal dystonia. And because he lacked sensation in his fingers, he hit a car door, also resulting in complex regional pain syndrome, you know, one of the worst. And so I'm going to show you his video. And this is pre-op evaluation. So he has, you can see, focal dystonia, severe pain. He's been under psychiatric care because suicide. the index. Because of the amount of pain that he was in. And you can imagine, if you're in that much pain all the time, 24-7, not unusual. And I'm seeing many of these type of patients. So if you ask people, neurosurgeons, what would you do there? Well, it's unclear, you know. Um, but I, we have a neuromodulation committee at the Mayo Clinic that decides on these really cutting edge stuff that we're doing. And in this case, the committee and myself, we felt, okay, let's target DBS. The target here could be nucleus accumbens for the pain, for dystonia, GPI, but also maybe cortical stimulation for the pain as well. And so. So here, just like a treating this patient like an epilepsy patient, what you're seeing is the electrodes, the deep electrodes, as well as the cortical electrodes. And what we found was that when we recorded from these electrodes, there were tons of these sharp waves. Do you see that? These are not truly seizures, but they're seizure-like activity, oscillation. In this case, in the motor cortex, which we mapped out into these very specific contexts. And when we put the permanent electrodes in, specifically into that area here, it's near the motor cortex. This is what we got. Can you tell me what it was like before surgery? Prior, it was stuck like this and spasming very hard. And now it opens and rotates and grabs things. It didn't used to grab things and, and I had two pinchers. That was it. And how is your pain? The pain is very reduced. So almost down to nothing. Almost down to nothing. How bad was it before? Oh, before it was uh, never under a seven out of ten. Never. So. It was, I, was, I was blown away when I saw this patient. But then, I want to show you one other patient. And, and this is the last patient that I will show you. And this has to do with patients. Can we now use this technology in the spinal cord? Can we move from the brain to the spinal cord? The previous speaker was talking about uh, bioelectronic medicine, using this type of technology throughout the whole body, control all kinds of bodily functions. So this is a patient who came to me uh, and we're, this is also under FDA-approved uh, study. Based on what Dr. Reggie Egerton and Susie Hakima had done in Louisville, that several years ago they said if you give a lot of physical therapy, do an epidural stimulation, and then a lot more physical therapy, that you can perhaps get volitional movement back. When I first heard about this, I said, you know, somebody needs to replicate that, one. 
and figure out how it's working. And so we obtained the funding to do this. This is a patient who unfortunately had very severe trauma, a, a snowmobile accident, resulting in a complete T6. You can see the surgeons had already done the fusion surgery, but of course, putting the bone back is not going to put the spinal cord back. He was T6 motor sensory complete. I did the surgery on this gentleman and placed a Medtronic electrode. And let me show you what we saw. This is the first day that we turned on the stimulation. And toe up. Stimulation is off. So up, 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 up. And what we're asking him Good. is move your uh, toes. Plantar flexion. Plantar flexion. Flexion. Flex, 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 flex. Good. Now knee flexion. Knee flexion. Okay, now we're going to turn it on. Move. Oh my god. Flex, flex, flex. Now knee flexion. Heel to the bum. Heel to the bum. Good. 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 <laughs> I was blown away when I first saw that. And that was me who said, oh my God. You know, I was just standing there. We didn't know what to expect. And the reason is because the previous reports were that it required months of physical therapy training. We got it on the first day. And this is on a patient that's been paralyzed for three years, who had terrible muscle atrophy, who was motor sensory complete. But this doesn't make sense. Because as a director of engineering, the way that I think about this is I'm going to need to take information out, put electrodes in specific to those motor fibers, and then play those muscles kind of like the way that you would play a piano. But in this case, what we're seeing is the conscious control from the brain is somehow going through that spinal cord lesion and getting back volitional movement. And that volitional movement is controlled. So that's Dr. Leverov, who's asking him, you know, please step like movement. Because ultimately, we want this person to when we were doing it earlier. Yeah. regain walking. Better. Yeah. And those are simply to get rid of, it's not really movement. Those are just harnesses to lift the leg. So like to get rid of the grab. Remember, he hadn't moved his leg for three years. Yeah. He's way saying faster. Sorry, just stepping back. You see, Dr. Leverov, he's scary. He's going to kick it his leg off of those things. Now slow down. And you can see the contacts we're stimulating at the top at 25 hertz. So Dr. Leverov is saying faster. And we're getting his EMG. You can see that. So this is controlled motor activation. And, and that whole idea of control systems is extremely important. And then, of course, functionally, we need to help these patients. Can you stand? He hadn't stood for three years. Can you sit? Again, controlled movements. And we're now training him for walking. Can you do that? Which really changes the paradigm, how we think about even what is motor control. Even perhaps the paradigm of consciousness. Is conscious awareness just in the brain, or is, could it be somehow in the spinal cord as well? I know that's pretty strange thought. I, I think it's strange. My last slide, overwrite. He said, no flying machine will ever fly from New York to Paris, because no known motor can run at the requisite speed 
for four days without stopping, over what? 1969, anybody know what happened in 1969? We went to the moon. Isn't that incredible? From the time to inventing controlled man flight, controlled man flight to going to the moon, less than 100 years. So it takes a team. Um, I would like to thank the funding agencies, especially Believe in Miracles Foundation, Craig Nelson Foundation, the Granger Foundation. We have numerous uh, NIH grants, including Brain Award and U01, several uh, R01s. The Mayo Clinic's Transform the Practice Award that supported that last slides that I showed. This is our team. That's my neuroengineering laboratory on the left. And then I would also like to thank Dr. Reggie Egerton and his team that collaborated with Mayo Clinic to make those, this patient stand. With that, thank you so much. In the meantime, we'll take some questions for Dr. Lee. Um, I'll, I'll start with uh, one. Uh, I'm going to reveal my ignorance about control theory here, but why use neural networks instead of just some more traditional control theory stuff, some simple stuff? Did that sure. not work? Sure. You know, the simplest like PID control systems, right? Which um, the issue is in order to identify the dopamine levels, we're using voltammetry in order to figure that out. There's a lot of drift in the system. The system also is a differential technique, so there's a lot of disadvantages to that system uh, that we're using as well. So simple control systems, although probably it would work as well, but not as well as, um, as the system that we have used. We are, however, um, we received a Brain Initiative Award to see whether we can change the voltammetry to a relative concentration measurement to absolute concentration measurements. And, and we're doing those studies. Mm -hmm. And I, so, the, so I'm not an engineer. I think you're asking me if you know um, more of an engineering question. <coughs> I think, in my opinion, PID type of system was what I thought about when I first um, had the idea of using neurochemistry as feedback loop systems. Um, the other issue is that, as I showed earlier, using the artificial neural network, we were able to get much closer in, in terms of the control systems. Yes, so, so even though uh, I, I did place two DBS electrodes and those cortical electrodes, the sure. DBS electrodes um, were not as effective, and the cortical electrodes was so, as you can see there, uh, so well able to control the dystonia and the pain, uh, we actually took the deep electrodes out. Now, what I would like to do in the future is to look at what are the circuits, even superficial and deep, that are activated using our fMRI system. But um, unfortunately, I do not yet have the approval, IRB approval, to use those specific electrodes. You know, there's a, a lot of issues when you put metal into the MRI and the MR heating issue, one. Second is also with the image distortion that, that happened. And so one of our engineers is working on exactly that, but I don't have the data yet on that. I think I saw another hand over here. Yes. Yeah, let's take one more. Very exciting. So is it able to uh, put the stem cell with your um, um, nice uh, strategy to enhance the uh, facility? Uh, yeah. Work? Yeah. So, so this is a really interesting question. Um, I think you're getting to, you know, this is not a cure. Uh, neuromodulation doesn't cure Parkinson's, it doesn't cure dystonia, any of these things. It is a symptomatic um, benefit to the patient. So I think what you're getting at is could we also use stem cells in conjunction with it? And of course the stem cell, the idea there is in the case of Parkinson's, could we really cure the patient, um, get the appropriate circuits, and deliver the dopamine to, for example, in the Parkinson's patient. And, and I know uh, several of the investigators that are working on that, and it is exciting, uh, the work. And, and I would encourage all of you to, I don't have the time to discuss all of the findings there, but there are some very exciting uh, stem cell work um, that's, that's going on. Particularly, I know of the work that's being done by Dr. Kwang Soo Kim at Harvard. Uh, not only the, you know, the stem cell produceable pluripotent stem cells, Thank you.
Lee, and I, I want to present you with this uh, token of our appreciation for uh, coming all this way and giving this great uh, talk to all of us. So thank you very much. Okay.